Now, let me introduce our two guests. John Waters is a film director, screenwriter, author, stand-up comedian, journalist, and visual artist. His books Role Model and Carsick were major national bestsellers, and his spoken word shows This Filthy World and A John Waters Christmas continue to be performed around the world. He is the founder of Dreamland Studios and the mind behind numerous beloved cult films, including Mondo Trasho, <laughs> Multiple Maniacs, okay, I like this, Cry Baby, Cecil Be Demented, Pink Flamingos, and many others, including, of course, Hairspray, which was made into a Broadway hit that swept the 2003 Tony Awards. <laughs> Aside from filmmaking, John also is an accomplished writer, photographer, and visual artist. He has published multiple collections of his journalistic exploits, screenplays, ruminations, and artwork. In 1999, Waters was honored with the Filmmaker on the Edge Award at the Provincetown International Film Festival. In September 2015, the British Film Institute ran a program to celebrate 50 years of Waters films, which included all of his early films. And in 2014, Waters was nominated for a Grammy for the spoken word version of his book, Car Sick. And his follow-up record, Make Trouble, was produced by Grammy-winning producer Ian Brennan and released on Jack White's Third Man Records in the fall of 2017. And then in 2018, Waters was named an Officer of the Order of Art and Letters, a cultural award from the French government. <laughs> so if that doesn't make you <laughs> a little inadequate, good for you. <laughs> now, David Schmader. David Schmader is a writer and performer devoted to exploring his obsessions from homophobic rock stars and conversion therapy to cannabis and trash cinema. From 1998 to 2015, Schmader was a staff writer and editor at The Stranger, Seattle's Pulitzer Prize winning Newsweekly, where he wrote the issue opening column, Last Days, The Week in Review. His solo plays Letter to Axel, Straight, and A Short-Term Solution for a Long-Term Problem have been produced in Seattle and across the US. In 2016, his book Weed, The User's Guide, was published in the US and in the UK. In his spare time, he enjoys showgirls, Paul Verhoeven's, <laughs> yep, Paul Verhoeven's notorious stripper dramedy, which he's presented in annotated screenings across the US along with supplying his commentary track for the Showgirls DVD. <laughs> John's book, Mr. Know-It-All, of course, is the subject of tonight's talk. And after all that, please join me in welcoming John Waters and David Schneider. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, wow. I could do my Christmas show. No, that's what it is. Hi, John Waters. How are you? Um, so, first things first, you must understand how much this city loves you. Oh, that's very sweet. Thank you, thank you. Well. I've always had a great history here. All my movies always played here. I've done my Christmas show years ago. I'm doing it again this year. So basically, it's been a city that has always been wonderful to me. We did Hairspray here in the beginning, was the tryout, which was really exciting. So I spent a month or two here during that time. So I got to know it a little bit. It was great. Great. Um, all right, so you have this brand new book that you will be selling and signing after this with your other books. Um, it's Mr. Know-It-All, The Tarnished Wisdom of a Filth Elder. That's me. <laughs> okay, and this book is packed with uh, teachable moments about uh, life and art and death and money. I love you talk <laughs> about money. Uh, but the, the main thread seems to be, especially at the start, is you grappling with your new cultural stature. Well, and I, I'm honored by all the great things that have happened to me. It just proves that if you stick around long enough and they can't get rid of you, then they're nice. 
Because now I do my show and I come out and they give me a standing ovation. I said, I didn't say anything. That means because I'm old, right? <laughs> uh, it's afterwards, maybe, if you like it, you do that. But uh, I, I'm actually kind of joking, although I think all the advice in my book is good advice to everybody. And I wrote a book called Role Models, which was about all the people that I looked up to when I was young that gave me the freedom to be who I wanted to be. And I tried to do that with everything I've learned in 50 years of doing this about negotiation, about Hollywood, about sex, about love, about how to deal with death, uh, everything. I think I'm, Mr. Know-it-all knows everything except about sports and science fiction. <laughs> Uh, um, where do you keep your medal from the French government for furthering the arts in France? It's, it's hanging on my bulletin board, you know. And <laughs> I have the little box, though. I mean, I don't have it on right now. You know, I don't wear it to the store in Baltimore. <laughs> but it was a great honor to get it. It was at the French Embassy, and, uh, and it was exciting. And I, have, I do love French movies. I love Bruno Dumont. I love Gaspard Noe. I like, I like a lot of French movies. And I did present Margarita Duras' film at the French Embassy, and a lot of people came, and no one ever comes to her movies, I promise you. <laughs> and I wanted to make it so we let everybody in free and made them pay to get out. <laughs> and really do exploitation, like win a date with Gerard Depardieu. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have Margarita Duras look-alike contest, you know, and she was not, uh, she was quite scary looking. Uh, and I met her once and she said, I don't care if anybody sees my movies. I thought, oh, how French, you know. <laughs> But in the book, somebody, in the beginning, I think if you start out whatever you're trying to do and you're immediately accepted, that is scary. That means it won't last, I think. I think, but yet somebody beside you and your mother has to think you're good, right? I spent the first 10 years of my career, no one liked it. I mean, the audiences did, but I got all bad reviews and I used them in the ads. I built a career on bad reviews. Now, today, that wouldn't work. If I got all bad reviews for this book, it would really hurt. So it, it's shame. It, you have to use that kind of stuff in the beginning, and as you get older, then you have to desperately hold on to your mantle, right? <laughs> um, so so a, a good chunk of the book is, is talking through your films, particularly the films that uh, came after Shock Value. Shock well, yeah, Value. Shock Value goes up to right before Polyester, right. and this is uh, Polyester On, but it's also in hindsight, you know, much more hindsight than Shock Value was because I had just made those movies then. So this is the weird thing that I realized in my life is that my early movies, like Pink Flamingos and the ones that are the most notorious, I didn't make any money on. But the big Hollywood ones, I made a lot of money on and they all failed at the box office. <laughs> so I, I failed upwards, which is something... <laughs> That's really a good lesson to learn how to do in Hollywood. And it's possible, because in Hollywood, it's just about the, the impression of success. It, it doesn't have to be real. It just you have to grab that moment while they are. And then when you can't, you go to Europe and pretend you're misunderstood. <laughs> There's a, a, a wonderful chapter devoted to the miracle of the film Hairspray. And uh, I love your characterization of the, of the film as not a musical, but a dance movie. It, was, it wasn't a musical. A Crybaby was my no, musical. Yeah. It was a no. dance movie, yeah. And, uh, and, and that movie amazed when I... It was a success when the movie came out, then the Tony Award. Did I ever think I'd be on stage with winning the Tony Award with the people that did it? And, uh, and then the big Hollywood version, the NBC version. It keeps on. They paid me to write three sequels. Uh, one for a TV show, one for uh, <coughs> a sequel to the musical, and another one very recently with HBO as a, a, a sequel to my movie. They didn't happen, but they keep paying me, so that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> it's better. It's a really fabulous unemployment, kind of, you know? <laughs> and so um, I think I was treated very fairly by Hollywood through the years. Um, I had a lot of hassle with them, and I talk about that in the book, but I never really named the executives and stuff that gave me trouble because, I don't know, I cashed the check, and, uh, and their job was to make money, and I didn't for them. So they were right in some ways, uh, but, 
but if I had done what they wanted to do, they, it would have been even less successful. That's what it was hard to do. And my films keep playing. They keep coming out. It's Criterion's now doing Polyester. They did, you know, Multiple Maniacs. They did Female Trouble. They keep playing. They play on television. So I'm thinking in the book, the day I die, maybe there'll be a perk in DVD sales and they'll finally break even. That's beautiful. Well, I'm trying to be fair to them, too. <laughs> um, you, in the book, you mentioned, uh, I'm going back to the original Hairspray film, which is the only one I care about. Oh, and, <laughs> no, oh no, no. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I like the other one because like, you got to buy great shoes, I'm sure, because of that successful Broadway well, show. Well, I know what the Broadway show was, the thing that, in my life, was the most amazing thing. I made more money in that than I made in any other thing in my entire life. And Good. It was, uh, uh, and the people really treated me well. I learned so much about what goes into a Broadway show, how it happens, how it's directed, everything. So um, to me, it was a really, it was a miracle that that happened. And it's still playing. And, um, and it's a Trojan horse that snuck in mid-America because even racists like it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's, that line made me do a spit take from your book, sir. <laughs> um, you should like, buy, buy John Waters' books, but also consider getting the audiobook because dude reads them and they're so good. <laughs> um, okay, you have some beautiful things to say about the performance of Ricky Lake. Oh, the... Ricky's great. She's the, she invented Tracy, you know? And, uh, and all over the world. When we made that movie, about 10 fat girls came. We, we advertised an ample woman who's proud of it. We didn't want to say the F word. And, uh, and she came, but hardly anyone else did. Luckily, she was perfect. But then later, when the NBC version, as a publicity stunt, I believe, looked for Tracy everywhere, thousands of big girls came out to audition. So I think Tracy did change it. I think because the reason it worked is because at that time, a fat girl stood for every outsider, any kind, racial, sexual, anything. She stood for that. And, and uh, no fat girl ever got the guy in a movie or was a star up till that. And even the girl, Mary Lou, that was the real Amber on the Buddy Dean show, and she's my friend, and she said, you know, a black girl could have gotten on easier than a fat girl. Not one fat girl, she said, ever even auditioned, even tried to get on or anything. Whoa. It was unknown. And then there was a dance, the waddle, that was made for fat girls, right? That they did on the show, waddle like a duck. And, uh, <laughs> and Ricky does it in the movie for a short time because in that scene, we cut out the part where Amber says, she's got roaches in her hair, but I actually put real cockroaches in her hair, and she's never let me forget that. And then I cut it out, which made it worse, because the producer said, what is this, a Bunuel movie all of a sudden? Which was true. It was a little out of place. <laughs> So it sounds like it, Hairspray was as joyful to make as it was to watch, and then there's the real life fact of uh, Divine's passing. So well, quickly Divine, on that's heels. terrible, and that's in the book, and it's it's kind of a very sentimental, sad story. I'm still shocked Divine is dead. Uh, he died two weeks after we made that movie, and it stopped it. You know, it was because all the news teams we had been all around the country promoting it, so they had shots of us together, and then they cut to me carrying the coffin. You know, that doesn't make people want to go see your movie. Um, <laughs> But the graveyard where Divine's buried was pretty great, and we've all bought graves there now. Me, Mink, every, we call it disgrace land. And it's kind of <laughs> being, being buried with your friends is something people don't do. And we thought maybe our families would be uptight. They weren't, because they don't want you coming to their grave. <laughs> <laughs> The, it, for divine service, you said that she was like, fuck donations to a charity, I want flowers. I want flowers. And then even the florists sent thank you notes because they got so much business. And the, <laughs> and the thank you notes were funny. Whoopi Goldberg wrote and said, see what a good review will do for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings up the thing is that Hairspray opened doors for... Divine was about up. ready to go on Married with Children as a season regular playing a male gay character and uncle, which would have been really radical for the time for a Shit, big, yeah. giant hit TV show, and it probably would have worked and changed his career in a huge way. Um, in a weird way, you ended up being kind of the most 
powerful early gay character I got to see on TV as an inky Simpson dude. Yeah, on which one? When you were on The Simpsons. Oh, The Simpsons, yeah. Children still come over to me in airports and say, pick me up. I can't pick you up. <laughs> look at me. I look like Chester the Molester. <laughs> I can't pick you up. <laughs> and I like to say inappropriate things to children, like... <laughs> You got any cigarettes? <laughs> or my favorite is to say to an innocent child, have you ever seen the dead? <laughs> Speaking of which, I, I was lightly gutted by the story of uh, Divine's parents and the headstone. Well, the Divine, it was very, you know, Divine and his parents didn't speak for about 15 years because... Uh, they, what parent would be glad their son was in drag eating dog shit? Really? <laughs> I mean, no one's that liberal. And <laughs> so, but they they made up and they were friendly at the end and everything. And uh, and so Divine's parents put uh, his real name, Glenn Milsa, but then they put Divine on the grave, which was pretty amazing in the headstone. <laughs> And people still go, and they write all sorts of things on it. They write, like, the filthiest person alive, and satin. And, no, they wrote Satan and Pat Moran. So they meant satin. They just couldn't spell. <laughs> but the graveyard woman said to me, since I'm going to be buried there, she said, you can leave instructions about what you want to do with graffiti. And I said, well, it's a hard thing to explain. Like, and then Pat Moran said, they'll probably just write cunt on mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, that would be offensive, but cunt eyes would be okay, because so that's a line in Pink Flamingos, but it's hard to tell graveyard workers that. Cunt, no. Cunt eyes, that's fine. And you mentioned that, that, that the dead have some say over how graffiti is treated on their gravestones, that, that you, when you're buying a plot, you kind of get to describe, like, this is a kind of graffiti, that how you should handle Oh, yeah, that's graffiti. what I'm saying. You can, you can leave instructions about okay, the right. kind of graffiti you want. Well, it just depends how creative you are. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that, that is something to imagine. You have to even worry about that after you're dead. <laughs> um, okay, you mentioned and those that. Grave, that only thing when I'm in a graveyard, I'm always looking at those ones that bury you. They're something creepier. They're necrophiliacs, I think. They're always waiting. But where else are you going to get a job if you're into that? And, you know, <laughs> and necro necrophilia, it is fear of performance. <laughs> and that's all. That's what causes that. Nobody can say, oh, you can't get it up, huh? <laughs> it might, in this part of the country, it might be easier to sell as kind of a green recycling idea. <laughs> Well, with recycling, you know, it's a little late to worry after you're dead. But if you get a wooden coffin, the gases can make it explode, which I like that idea in the middle of a funeral <laughs> of nauseous, poisonous gas. His coffin exploded while people were running. That would be really dramatic. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay, you, you just tossed this off like we weren't going to say anything. You wrote, you sat down and wrote Hairspray sequels? I, would like I wrote to hear three it. of them. I wrote, <laughs> the first one was called uh, White Lipstick. And that was after the 60s were over and they're all unemployed and they don't know what to do. And Link turns into a drug addict and Edna loses weight and, you know, and everything. And then the other one was a TV series that was more about Penny and Seaweed, about checkerboard couples and their, you know, fight for equality. And then the new one is called, it's the sequel to Hairspray, Later. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what that one is because I want to make it. I don't want to okay. give it away. It tells a little bit about it in the book. It, it describes the plot. Yeah. Okay. And then I always say the porn version, pubic hairspray. <laughs> <laughs> And, but it wouldn't sell because young people don't have pubic hair anymore. <laughs> and, and I think PETA should start worrying, because where do crabs go? <laughs> They're extinct. Because of you selfish young people and razors. <laughs> 
pick me up. <laughs> All right. Beyond your own work, uh, the book presents a ton of valuable opinions on, on other people's art um, and, and lots of other things. And one key bit of wisdom, never tell anyone I love you unless they're sleeping. That's true. <laughs> because it doesn't demand an answer. You can't be disappointed. There's nothing about control. And they hear you. But just say it very softly when they're sleeping. I love you. That's the only time you should ever say it. I promise you, it took me 70 years to learn that. <laughs> um, you uh, have some opinions on rock and roll music, which I enjoyed greatly. Um, I have on all kinds of music. I have a whole chapter called I Got Rhythm, which is basically telling you how to have musical taste. And every person can... the. To, can, the best thing is to think the first song that you loved that your parents hated. That is when your own musical taste begins. And then you can do a, a, a mixtape of your entire soundtrack of your life starting with that and how that branches out into other kinds of music. Yeah, so uh, the, the Rebellion playlist was this thing. And you also mentioned that uh, first hearing Elvis Presley literally, literally drove you to masturbate. Yes, and I had never heard of masturbation. I thought, is this the only thing that this time this has ever happened? You know? <laughs> and the Carol Maddow, she thought she invented the blowjob. I read, I read in her book, she gave one and thought, isn't this great? I got to tell people about this. <laughs> she thought she invented it. Well, I thought I had invented masturbation because no one had told me about it. And I'm like, oh my God. But to Elvis, how rock and roll is that, though, really? Because he was twitching and like went really early Elvis, you know, in 1956 when he was like a spaceman almost. You forgot how, how he's still the king. You know? Yeah. I like Justin Bieber too, but I liked it better when he was huffing paint with bad rappers. <laughs> <laughs> he was naked all the time too, yeah. Fuck you, Dad. Uh, conversely, you write about hating the Beatles. I did hate them if they were too fucking cheery for me. <laughs> now I like them all right. I like them now. But uh, no, that's why I like punk, you know, because it was, it was, and I still like punk, and I host this big Burger Boogaloo festival every year. It's a, and uh, it's a big punk rock festival in Oakland. It's really good. So I always felt at home in the punk community because it was boys on the down low and big girls with attitudes. And yeah, it was fun. I still like it. Um, I especially liked your writing on country music, which you kind of approach like an alien visiting Earth of like, have you heard this shit? Well, I, I mean, I like listen to Outlaw Country on the radio. <laughs> I love that station. And they're all songs I haven't heard, like Snake Farm. What a great song. And, <laughs> and some of these ones about the Hangover Tavern, and some of them are really good. So I, I learn a lot from that radio station. Yeah. And uh, another line from the book, Classical is for crazy people, too. Well, it is. Glenn Gould, I mean, he's yes. like really great and crazy. And uh, um, Maria Callas, I mean, anybody that, you know, dated Pasolini, and then she went out with Aristotle Onassis and got dumped when he went for Jackie Kennedy. She's got a story. She should be screaming mad scenes in opera. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you have, you just mentioned in passing, but you have a serious admiration for Glenn Gould. I do. I love, I think he's just so beautiful and handsome, and, and I love his music, and he's so eccentric, like, mm -hmm, making all those noises, and I loved he stood on the north side of the room because it's colder. I, I, I'm like that, too. I'm like a fat person. It's always too hot everywhere. Uh, um, you're really good at talking shit about Pope Francis. Oh, I hate that fucker. I'll tell you, <laughs> I don't feel bad saying that. Because the Catholic Church has been bashing my lifestyle since A.D. began. So uh, I don't want to hear what he says. Who am I to judge about? Who are you? You're the fucking Pope. And then he says he gives women a year of mercy which he, for, that have had abortions. Well, when you get pregnant, you can start giving people freedom from abortion, you know? So, no, I don't like him. And, and 
the Catholic Church to me, who attacks me and my, everything I believe in and everything, is really even more shocking to me is what I realized, that they were a worldwide pedophile organization. They really were. And it's coming out more and more and more and more. So, yeah, I, I don't feel any guilt in bashing them. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. <laughs> uh, Although I've always said, I'm glad I'm Catholic, because sex will always be dirty. <laughs> you also have that, this beautiful scene, it's later in the death-obsessed part, but of your severed head being placed in the Pope's bed. Well, I, I'm talking about when, you know, when they bury people, they, I'm not saying I'm like these people, but Charlie Chaplin, they stole his body and held it ransom, and I love his widow refused to pay it, and then they gave it back and apologized, and she accepted? Well, that's liberal. And then they stole F.W. Murnau's head and never got it back, and I don't want somebody stealing my head in some goth girl's basement apartment <laughs> where they're watching bad horror movies, you know. If you steal my head, put it under the Pope's bed cover so when his legs go down, oh! <laughs> um, it's a short sheet. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a pie bed. All right. Um, can you explain the concept uh, of no vacation to our guests? A no vacation is when you go on vacation but you still work a couple hours a day, which is what I do in Provincetown. It's my 54th summer living there. So, um, I, and now all the beaches I go to are where the sharks attack people. So it's even edgier now. <laughs> I, think, I think it makes it better. Um, in the Provincetown chapter, you name-check your favorite drag queen. Can I entice you to not name-check that drag queen again? Dina Martina is my favorite. Yeah, yeah. I, definitely. And I always said if I was president, she would be my first lady, because she could scare Barbara Bush. Yeah. Oh. Um, all right, along with the music, there's this fair amount of art appreciation, and I, this book opened a window on a world of contemporary painting that I was not familiar with, and it's uh, the work of Congo and Betsy. Well, it's the only art left to collect. It's the, it's the art of chimpanzees that was in the 50s, a huge movement to make fun of abstract expressionism. <laughs> and it started with Betsy in Baltimore. And uh, she was so famous, she toured America wearing little smock dresses and did finger paints and stuff. And then Coco, another monkey in the London Zoo, challenged her to a paint-off. And it was an international event. Picasso bought one, Man Ray did, but they bought all Coco's. Misogyny in the art world already, <laughs> already. And Betsy came home, and then they, they got, the zookeeper got her a boyfriend they had to pay for, and in a tragedy that rivals Jackson Pollock's car accident, he fell on her in the cage and killed her. I know, and, uh, but her paintings are, every zoo has paintings by their gorilla because it was a huge fad then. They're just sitting there waiting to be flipped in the art market, I'm telling you. But don't go for art photography from, from monkeys because last year a naturalist left cameras in the jungle and monkeys did take selfies and he published them as a book and PETA sued saying the monkey owned the copyright, not him. <laughs> But they had to settle. They had to settle. So who needs that controversy when you're building a collection? No, stick to paintings. Don't go with monkey photography, really. Here's the thing. Um, it seems like I should ask you about Trump, but it seems too tawdry. Well, I didn't mention him in the book because it dates it. And all my books are still in print. And, and so, I, I, you know, it just dates it. I talk about Trump a lot in my spoken word show, and my Christmas show. I mean, do you want to talk about him? I, he looks like a white James Brown impersonator now. Um, <laughs> I bet he shaves his asshole. Imagine having sex with him. Oh, gag the flag. <laughs> yeah, I... I guess it's it, that we have a president that I feel is too disgusting to bring up with John Waters. Well, you just did. <laughs> so, but I hate to say, he's going to win again. 
what? We have 21 characters. Candidates, they're all weak. They're all going to attack each other. They're going to debate. Should the Boston bomber be allowed to vote? Are you fucking kidding? <laughs> they should have a big meeting and plan who's going to be the two left. And let's just get it over with. And let's win. Let's win. Uh, this is something I'd love to ask everyone, but what art has been getting you through the Trump era? Well, art gets me through every era, really. I mean, I like art that pisses you off. I like art that's the same that rises the bait of people that hate contemporary art. They say, my kid could do that. Well, stupid, they should have. just sold for a million bucks. <laughs> uh, I like this artist, Karen, Karen Sander. She never even saw her canvas. She just told her art dealer to throw it outside, and it got mold all over it. And it's like really ugly and everything. And kind of, I said, well, I wanted to buy it. But then you had to get a scientist had to treat it because it was poisonous, right? So it was art that if you brought it in your house, it could kill you, really, basically. <laughs> wreck your house, spread all over it, then disappear, and it was ugly and expensive. And I thought, that's the perfect piece of contemporary art. Yeah. <laughs> A piece of advice in the book that, that hit me is, was along the lines of, okay, fight the squares, fuck shit up, but don't be so mad about it. Be funny about it. Well, I think terrorism of humor is good, you know, and that's why I like the Satanic Temple. I think they're really funny, and they, they use humor as terrorism to fight against church and state, and, and they win. Uh, the yippies did that. Uh, I think it's been forgotten today and, as, as a way to embarrass and humiliate the enemy through humor. So I am for that, yes. Yep. Um, at, the, at, at the end of the book, there's a, my favorite chapter, the death chapter. Oh, the death chapter, yeah. Um, a few things, well, one thing, you, you're, you're not looking forward to death at all, which I'm, I guess shouldn't be a surprise, but the, the one thing you seem to be happy about death is that it means the end of pooping. Yeah, I never have to shit again. That is the most <laughs> disgusting thing that we have to do, really. I, I, I have... I, I don't think there should be public lavatories. Aren't you house trained <laughs> to go out and do that on an airplane? I've never been in there, really. <laughs> I can't imagine how disgusting it is. Yeah. And you have some beautifully singular views about the end of life along the lines of, fuck hospital visits, don't look at me in my oh, final no, days. Oh, no, I, I think David Bowie and, and, and Nora Ephron were right. When I'm dying, I don't want people to come visit me. I, I remember my parents at the end of their life, 90 years old, and my brother when he died. I don't want to see them at the AIDS people I know at the last when they look the worst, desperate. I want people to remember me when I was vibrant and well. Call me up, you know, but don't come look and say, oh, you're looking well. I'm not looking well. I'm hooked up to machines. So, really, I, I don't want people to see that, really. So, I, I, I understand why they did that. They died in private. Uh, um, is there anyone in particular you are happy to have outlived? Oh. <laughs> well, I don't speak ill of the dead. <laughs> so maybe the censor woman in Baltimore. Uh, but I didn't go spit on her grave or anything. Uh, sure, there's lots of people. But you know what? I, I don't... I regret only one thing in life, smoking cigarettes. That's the only thing I regret. I wish I had never done it, uh, because it, it is terrible and it does kill you. Uh, but when I was young, they said, cool, doctors recommend smoking cools when you have a cold. How was that ever legal, even in the 50s? <laughs> so uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not bitter. I think basically that uh, you can blame your parents till you're 30 and then get over it. Life is not fair. If, if there was such a thing as karma, Edith Massey would be alive and Pence would be maybe not. Um, so it's, it's, there is no such thing as karma. Life isn't fair, but you just have to deal with the hand you got, really. And I think you can't order up your kids, you can't order up your parents, and the only thing a parent can do is make their kid feel safe, and that's the hardest job a parent has to do. And then no matter how crazy they are, they won't go off the deep edge, I think. That's a good, pure thought. <laughs> um, call me you mentioned Dr. Spock. <laughs> dead censors, which brings us a little bit to um, A Dirty Shame, which was, uh, you, uh, it's a great, rich chapter about a movie that I had never heard so much about, that it, uh, like, shocking <laughs> production history. Well, to me, dump, excuse me, 
<laughs> I have the croup. Um, <laughs> remember that? You never hear that term anymore. Do you She's remember? got the croup. My mother always used to say that. What's trench mouth part of your I life? I don't know what the croup is. They don't have it anymore, but I got it. Um, what were we oh, dumb censors are easy to deal with. You can use them. They can be your publicity <laughs> agent, like the Maryland Censor Board woman who said to me, don't tell me about sex. I was married to an Italian. <laughs> uh, but... The evil ones are the liberal ones, like the people that run the Motion Picture Association of America that are intelligent and kind. They're the evil censors because liberal censors know how to talk and they know how to win and, and you can't get beyond them. So I, I think that the, the Motion Picture Association is that finally the woman that runs it has retired. But they, it's a different ball game today. They're, they say for the American family, well, there's a lot of different kind of families now. So everyone's values are very different. They're not all the same, this beaver cleaver kind of thing. And it's still weird. You know, they're pro, they don't censor violence and they don't, I don't even think they should censor that either, really. Even the dumbest person when they go see Chainsaw Massacre doesn't think, were they hurt for real? <laughs> they don't, really. So, um, I don't know. I think you should have sex, and, but just don't go if you don't want to see it. That's the best censorship there is. And in Dirty Shame, it, what I took from the book, it came down to a kind of a battle about felching? Well, no. I heard <laughs> that she objected. She didn't know what it meant. She asked somebody what it was. And I was going to argue, that's not true. Felching is when you fart in the bathtub and bite the bubble. <laughs> Could she prove it wasn't? <laughs> and that's PG-13. <laughs> uh, we uh, didn't show felching. We just mentioned the possibility of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was very surprised to know about who was originally your star or possible star of A Dirty Shame, which was which Roseanne was Barr. Roseanne, yeah, she was here when we, with me in Seattle and read the script and everything and said she wanted to do it and then went home and I never heard from her again. I think her kids read it. <laughs> I think that's what happened. <laughs> but Roseanne, when I knew her, was a liberal. I mean, I don't know what happened. She was very different when I knew her. Um, how are we doing on our time before we have to transition to Q&A land? Great. What kind of pornography do you like? Well... <laughs> I, I, that's a fair question. Um, I used to like the Bobby Garcia, all the marine porn, but, and I went to visit him and I wrote about him in Role Models. Now porn is free. I don't have that guilt tax. I think you need to pay for porn. I don't think it's right that it's free. That you can type in the most hideous sex act and it just comes right up. Oh my God. It's too available. And, uh, there aren't any porn stars anymore, really. There aren't. Like There's Jeff Stryker or all the ones I liked. You know, uh, and I think I get, Amer I get adult video news, which is the porn um, variety, kind of. <laughs> and even that's changed. It used to be great. It had interviews with all of them, and they were so serious. They said, my mother handles the fan mail. She does? <laughs> you know, it would be amazing to me. Yeah. <laughs> she does? And you're doing double anals? I mean... <laughs> oh. Yeah, we're getting down to my fun questions now. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess, I, yeah, no. Um, we're going to transition to letting other people ask you some questions right. now. <laughs> we're going to transition to what? To other people ask. <laughs> oh, okay. so I'm going to You have to be careful these days what you agree to. <laughs> All right. Um... <laughs> So we have uh, two microphones. Places and what would here. really help us is if you dim us and bring the house lights up, yeah, and dim us something. Now we can see people. God, it looks like church in here. It looks great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, yes, if you have questions for John Waters, you have to come all the way up here. That's so microphone. intimidating. But yeah, okay. Hi. Hi. My niece went to University of Baltimore and introduced me to burger cookies, which yep. are horrible. But in your Maryland days, did you ever come across Spiro Agnew? Did I ever what? 
come across Spiru Agnew. Yes, and I feel bad about something. And I am for free speech. I'm kind of against in colleges today when they're stopping people from speaking, no matter how odious. Because I think free speech, I believe we have to have extremes. We have to put up with that to do it. But once, I went to see Agnew when I was a yippie, and we screamed and stopped him from speaking. And I felt bad about that. I always knew somehow that that wasn't really right. But I never met him, but he grew up in certainly the same neighborhood I did and everything. And I remember when, didn't one of his kids get busted for pot or something? I don't know. We wanted to meet her, but we never could. <laughs> uh, so I never met him. But certainly I have a shot. The official state portrait of him is in Serial Mom, when Kathleen Turner walks by it right before she kills Patty Hearst. She walks right <laughs> past Spyro Agnew's portrait. Do you care about cannabis? Is that part well, of your life? No, well, I, the one thing that we didn't talk about that in the book that I did, I haven't taken drugs really for 50 years, but I needed to do a stunt. So in my last book, I hitchhiked across the country when I was 66 years old by myself. This time, I took really strong acid with Ming Stoll <laughs> when I was 70 years old. And it was great. You know, I, I hadn't done it in 50 years, and I was really scared. And if I knew how strong it was, I really would have been scared because we hallucinated for 12 hours. And, and I got it. I spent eight months getting it from basically Timothy Leary's asshole. I mean, it was the provenance was the last person that got it from him. And uh, it was really good. We had a great time. So, and my mother always used to say, don't tell young people to take drugs. I'm not. I, you're pussy micro doses you all take but uh <laughs> but 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 i am telling old people if <laughs> yes if you took acid when you were young and had all good experiences with it yeah take it again uh then they can't say you're having a senior moment you're tripping Hi. Oh. <laughs> I really enjoy. Oh, sorry. I, we have. I will be right back. We're, this is. We have someone first. Hi. Hi. Uh, in a collection of Mike Kelly videos or uh, interviews, that uh, there's one with you, and he explains cyber sex yep. for you. And so I was wondering, uh, in to say 20 years since that conversation occurred. Well, I like Mike Kelly a lot. He's, he's one of my favorite artists, and I wrote about him a lot in Role Models, and uh, I spoke at his funeral. And um, I, I, he, was, he invented pitiful in art. That was so great. And I go now and see, like, in really fancy uptown galleries, those arenas, he called, which are just dirty blankets he found in a thrift shop with three crummy old stuffed animals sitting on it, and they're a million five. I think that is the power of art. It's a magic trick. So um, I loved him, and, and I think actually he killed himself because he became too successful, maybe. I don't know, that's a hard thing to imagine. But um, I don't know, it wasn't a cry for help, he did it. And, uh, and he's, he's still really, really a great artist, I think, very, very much. And we interviewed each other, and uh, that was in Grand Street Magazine, right? And, uh, but I, I knew Mike for years, and I collected his art, and uh, I gave a big speech about him at the Hammer Museum, and he gave me this beautiful outtake of some, so we were friends, yep, and I think he's a great, great artist. I'm sorry, my question was... Uh... Oh. <laughs> You, 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 he explained cyber sex to you. Cyber sex, and is I that... was wondering if, if you ever figured out how to how to uh, engage sexually with somebody online. Online, well, see, I don't get even like today when you're when you're texting, talking dirty. Do you misspell? Is that butch? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how online you talk dirty. Just use poor English, and I don't know. It's hard to affect. So no, I haven't really figured it out. Yeah, I'm still trying. Right. Hi. This is a trivia of Odorama. I still have my old card, and it's getting weak. Uh, can you ever do that again? 
Can I ever what? We are Odorama doing it again. For... We're doing it again right now for the new Criterion version. And there were many different versions. There were many different versions. It came out twice in the beginning. Then it came out in Europe. They had it in French one. They had all different ones. And now it's even harder because I thought there'd be a million places now that would do that. The 3M company doesn't do it anymore. Any of the smell companies, there's very few laps. So it's getting harder to do. But we're working on run right now for the new release. Yeah. And the old ones, nothing's ever going to work that good because they still, I've said, what is that odor in my house? And it's an old odorama card. I have to put it outside. It's been smelling for 30 years, stinking up. <laughs> and they don't. They don't fade away. Those original ones are pungent, I'll tell you. Well, it's very smart to put the uh, air, um, air deodorizer at the end. Well, that was the last one to give you a nice smell to leave with. But I always knew that all over the world people would give me money to smell a fart. And they would. In <laughs> communist, any kind of government, any kind. They'd hear it, they'd see number two, and number two is in every language means that. And, and then they'd reach for it and still smell it. I know. It's Hi. universal. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. Uh, Cecil B. Demented is my favorite thing that you've ever done. Thank so you thank, very much. Thank you for everything, but thank you for that. And I'm sorry if you've heard this a billion times. But if you were one of the sprocket holes, what director would you get tattooed on you? What would I do? Oh, what would I get a tattoo? Joseph Losey. Um, I, I just did the boom came out again, my favorite failed art film. And I just did the commentary, a beautiful version. Just came out last week of it. So I would definitely do Joseph Losey. Did you do the commentary? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, have, have people in here heard John Waters' Mommy Dearest commentary? No. Uh, <laughs> But that one I did, I knew I'd get the job, because when they asked me, I said, but you know, I think it's a good movie, except for two scenes. If they had cut out two scenes, she would have won the Oscar, which is true. The no wire hangers, and you know, it's not you, I hate us the dirt. But those scenes are funny now, but it is a good movie, almost. And, and she would have won the Oscar if they just toned it down a little bit. I particularly liked your defense of the parenting. Well... <laughs> The reason I turned against the daughter is because she wrote the book. Then later in life, when it had faded and she didn't have anything else, she would appear at the Castro on stage with drag queens dressed as her mother and do stuff. To me, that is not a serious cry for revenge of bad parenting. <laughs> I don't know. And she started a whole trend. I mean, you know, Mommy Dearest, Daddy I mean, there's millions of those books, and Betty Davis's daughter did them, and they all did them. But, but um, and Joan, I don't know. I, I never, of course, never met her, but I did play William Castle in the Freud TV show, and I did meet Jessica Lang, who played Joan Crawford, but she was dressed as Joan Crawford, so when I met her, and I said, I'm still scared of you from Francis. <laughs> you know. But she was great. She was great in it. Hi. That's actually a good segue for my question. I actually was introduced to the films of William Castle by way of an essay you written about him. Yeah. So I was just hoping you would say a few words about how you had the opportunity to actually play and portray him on the future show. How what? Um, how how you portrayed William Castle yeah, and how you oh, prepared for it? Well, I've been writing about him, and I thought I'm not big like he was. And suddenly they said, said it didn't matter. So I I didn't really prepare that much because I I wrote the introduction to his autobiography when it came out. I met his widow. I met Terry Castle, his daughter. And last week, uh, Vandy Fair ran a picture of my desk, and I have on it a crocheted tingler that a fan sent me. And Terry Castle said to me, I want that. I'm jealous, because <laughs> her father made the tingler. Um, so uh, I just knew a lot about him and, and had been a, obsessed by him as a child. I saw all the movies where the buzzers went off under your seat and the skeletons came out and the go to Coward's Corner, even when he had seat belts on the seats. And I recently even found the, a manual for how to put in the buzzers under each seat, which was so complicated. You had to wire each three wires to each seat. They all had to connect to the aisle, run up to the projection booth. They would never be able to do that today when a movie opens in 1,700 screens. This was when movies opened first run in one theater downtown, played for four months, then went to a suburban theater once and vanished. You never saw them again. There was no video. There was nothing, really. Maybe on television 20 years later. So um, he was a great man that certainly... And there, there's a movie called Matinee, which is kind of the 
fictitious version of him that's pretty good. And um, he was just somebody that gave me um, really a, a great lesson in showmanship always. Thank you. Uh -huh. Hi. I think you've been standing for a little longer. We'll come back. No, come I, on up. I respect the other side of the room. He can ask great. <laughs> Hello. Hi. So I've heard that you like different crimes and sort of the justice system in the country. And I was wondering, over the last couple of years, have there been any crimes or trials that you've really had your eye on? Well, you know, I don't like crime. It's, I changed a lot about that. And I, and I wrote, I wrote in, in my last book, in, the, in Role Models, the chapter about Leslie Van Houten. Now, I apologize for some of that, you know, kind of smart-ass attitude. I'm interested in... Um, in crime, I'm interested in why people do things I can't understand. I think I would have been a good defense lawyer um, for the worst people that aren't sorry and lie and say they didn't do it. Somebody has to speak for them. And I kind of like the people that do, like Judy Clark. I mean, she's a, the only person I really want to meet. And she's done many of the capital cases. And if she wins, if they don't get the death penalty, they just get life. And uh, so I'm, I'm interested in, in some of the cases, and, but I don't go to the trials anymore because I'm visible now. People know it's me and they, you know, it looks like I'm grandstanding. And, and I think the jury might hate me and take it out and give the person the electric chair or something, you know? <laughs> I've never, I've, jury duty, every time I went down, I always said, well, I know two people that were sentenced to death. And that gets you right out, I tell you. <laughs> and I, I taught in prison for a while too, and, and so, I, I like it. I still visit people in prison. Um, but cases that have interest me, I, I'm interested in the American Taliban, John E. Walker Lynn, that I think most of that was fake news. I think it was hysteria about him, maybe. But I'm curious about that. And they just let him out. And I, I kind of like his parents. I've always read about them. So um, that's a case that, that certainly interests me very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Just take those and that'll be it. Okay. So as you probably know, this is a sold out show. You're speaking to a packed auditorium. What's a good collective first step for making the world a filthier place? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, get out your phone and go outside and find the best tableau of real life that horrifies you, right? and then take it and stylize it and turn it into comedy. And that way, it's an exercise in, in getting rid of your fears. And I think that's the best way to use her humor to change anybody's mind. I think that's the only way we can argue with anybody is make them laugh first. I'm not a separatist, I don't think. I, I understand why some people want to be for Trump because we make them feel stupid. Uh, they, some of it is, and, and they like him because we hate him. And he is doing what he said he was going to do. You know, I'd vote for any... I want Alfred E. Newman to run, actually. That's who I want. And I sort of wish... I held it against Mayor Pete that he didn't know who Alfred E. Newman was. I did. That's unforgivable to me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's a tough one. For, like, should a gay guy know who Alfred E. Newman is? Of that age, Alfred yeah. E. Newman, in, I mean, if it wasn't up for Alfred E. Newman, we wouldn't have Lenny Bruce. We wouldn't have, he was like <laughs> for the earliest at what me worry. I mean, you know, I'm a big fan of Alfred E. Newman. I would, and I think he did run for president. I think Mad Magazine at the time did have Alfred E. Newman for president. So, um, but you know, I, I'd vote for any of them above him. But I don't know, there's, uh, each one of them is problematic to me in a way. Yep. But I'd vote for any of them. Me too. Maybe not Kamala Harris because she's the enemy of prisoners, what she's done always to prisoners' rights. Just remember that. Yeah. Uh, as a teenager, you were and still are my favorite director, and part of the reason is because your movies are so much fun. Thank what you. What was the movie that you had the most fun making, and who was the actor or actress you had the most fun working with? You know what? I must say that I look back, I never had fun making those movies because they were too hard. I hated making movies. They were so hard. You have to be up 20 hours a day. You're over budget. The cars don't show up. It rains. But I look back on them proudly, and I look back on them remembering great experiences by making it. I would say the best mood on all the movies was probably Hairspray and A Dirty Shame. 
Um, but there were problems on all of them, certainly. Um, I liked working with all the stars. Kathleen Turner, I think. I think Serial Mom is my best movie, and I think Kathleen Turner is great in it. And I'm actually going to see her the day I get to Provincetown because she's up there now. So um, I really liked working with her. I love Johnny Knoxville. I think that his movies, Jackass, was the closest to Pink Flamingos than anything, <laughs> kind of. I think they're, they were going for the same thing. Um, I remember when Johnny Depp, when we made that movie, was at the height of when his teen idleness and he hated it. And I said, well, stick with us. We'll kill that, you know. <laughs> and... And then we had in that movie, it was so much fun because like Tracy Lords right after she'd escaped porn and Patricia Hearst and you know, it was like insane all those people together at once. That was really exciting. And that was my first Hollywood movie really where we had cranes and big lights and equipment and teamsters and everything. It was, it was kind of amazing really. And I look back on those movies when I was writing the book and everything, I think, how did I ever get any of these made? It's amazing to me. Because today it would be much, much harder to go in and get a development deal in a Hollywood studio. Because all they want now is movies for China that cost $100 million and have no dialogue or movie stars and special effects. And that's the only kind of movie I don't like, really. So it would be much harder today to make those movies, I think. Well, it was a lot of stress for you, but it was a lot of fun for us. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. For all of your work. Thank you. Hey there. So Hi. I'm actually here with a friend who worked for the East Baltimore Guide, and I was a bartender at the uh, premiere for Serial Mom at the Senator back in '94, just shy of my 21st birthday. Um, Wait a minute. I can't, with this mic, I can't hear. Yeah. You. Uh, can you speak a little more slowly? Sure. So I'm here with a friend it's just who a little worked echoey. for the East Baltimore Guide. Yeah. And I was a bartender at your premiere for Serial Mom at the Senator. And where did we have the, the at the Senator? At the Senator in 1994. Yeah, in yeah. Baltimore. I'm actually a Micah dropout um, in Baltimore. And I spent an inordinate amount of time at Vince and Dolores' house with yep. Tom Everhart, super high, early 20s. And so our question was... The place, Leslie and I spent a lot of time at Club Charles in our early 20s. What's going on there these days? The Club Charles is still good. I still go to the Club Charles. That's what we want to know. Yeah, it's kind of the hipster bar in Baltimore. It used to be the Wigwam, which was known as the scariest bar in Baltimore. And I, I wrote about that in Role Models, uh, where you could only get in if it was the opposite of Studio 54. You had to be a monster street person and you, and you gave your disability check to the woman that ran it and she controlled all of them. It was like Viridiana. And like, uh, it, it was really great. I saw somebody bite off a man's nose and spit it out in there. But <laughs> it was an amazing place. I'm glad it still exists. Those bars are vanished in Baltimore. Almost, they're almost all gone. All the bars I wrote about in Role Models, they're almost all gone. The Holiday House, which was a great, real hetero biker bar that I took Pee Wee Herman to, and he couldn't believe it. I said, he said, I said, this is just like the one you had in your movie. He said, I didn't know they were real, though. Right. And, uh, and it just closed, and they invited me back. It was really touching. All the people that we made a dirty shame with and all the bikers were there, and they ripped up part of the floor and gave it to me. It was a really, it was a nice end. But those bars, I think, are vanishing everywhere almost, except maybe Baltimore, which is the only city left that's cheap yeah. enough to have a bohemia. I don't know. It, it still is cheap there. Yeah, Come on that. down. We got edge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, our final question. Hello. Hello. So I've always wondered in the remake of Hairspray, why John Travolta? Well, I tell you. Like, I tell you why. There's not so I tell you why. Beautiful drag. John Travolta's starting. name got the entire film financed. Ah. If he hadn't been in it, it wouldn't have. Everybody wanted to see John Travolta dance again. He hadn't danced in a movie for a long time. I like John Travolta. I got along with him great. People we never talked about Scientology, but people said to me, how could you work with him as a Scientologist? I always said, first of all, Scientology, they've never said they're against gay people, but anyone that hates being gay that much, that wants to change and go, joins them, good, they'll just be bad boyfriends for us, you keep them. <laughs> we don't want them. They'll just be hell to be with, so let Scientologists have them, good, they're away from us. Um, 
He was lovely to work with. I liked him very much. Um, he was great. And I think he sold the movie. You know, the, the exit polls, who people picked they liked the best in the movie was John Travolta. So, and he sold the movie. Without his name, it would never have been made. That's why. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Good hand for him, too. Hey. And yeah. so let's go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll see you at the signing. Come. I'll do pictures. I'm a whore. All right. So we're, the signing's going to be in this room. We're going to bring a table to the front. The line. Left and circle around the room. So right in front here, to the left. It's all here.